Chapter Thirty Three of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With the morning came full consciousness. I realized bitterly all that had happened, but I was no longer inclined to bemoan my fate. My senses were stricken, as it seemed, too numb and rigid for any further outbreak of passion. A hard callousness took the place of outraged feeling and though despair was in my heart, my mind was made up to one stern resolve. I would look upon Sybil no more. Never again should that fair face, the deceitful mask of a false nature, tempt my sight and move me to pity or forgiveness. That I determined. Leaving the room in which I had passed the night, I went to my study and wrote the following letter. Sybil, after the degrading and disgraceful scene of last night, you must be aware that any further intercourse between us is impossible. Prince Rimenez and I are leaving for London. We shall not return. You can continue to reside at Willowsmere. The house is yours. And the half of my fortune unconditionally settled upon you on our marriage day will enable you to keep up the fashions of your set and live with that luxury and extravagance you deem necessary to an aristocratic position. I have decided to travel and I intend to make such arrangements as may prevent, if possible, our ever meeting again, though I shall, of course, do my best for my own sake to avoid any scandal. To reproach you for your conduct would be useless. You are lost to all sense of shame. You have abased yourself in the humiliation of a guilty passion before a man who despises you, who, in his own loyal and noble nature, hates you for your infidelity and hypocrisy, and I can find no pardon for the wrong you have thus done to me, and the injury you have brought upon my name. I leave you to the judgment of your own conscience, if you have one, which is doubtful. Such women as you are seldom troubled with remorse. It is not likely you will ever see me or the man to whom you have offered your undesired love again. Make of your life what you can or will. I am indifferent to your movements, and for my own part, shall endeavor as much as may be to forget that you exist. Your husband, Geoffrey Tempest. This letter, folded and sealed, I sent to my wife in her own apartments by her maid. The girl came back and said she had delivered it, but that there was no answer. Her ladyship had a severe headache and meant to keep her room that morning. I expressed just as much civil regret as a confidential maid would naturally expect from the newly wedded husband of her mistress, and then, giving instructions to my man Morris to pack my portmanteau, I partook of a hurried breakfast with Lucio in more or less silence and constraint, for the servants were in attendance, and I did not wish them to suspect that anything was wrong. For their benefit, I gave out that my friend and I were called suddenly to town on urgent business that we might be absent a couple of days, perhaps longer, and that any special message or telegram could be sent on to me at Arthur's Club. I was thankful when we at last got away, when the tall, picturesque red gables of Willowsmere vanished from my sight, and when finally, seated in a railway smoking carriage reserved for our two selves, we were able to watch the miles of distance gradually extending between us and the beautiful autumnal woods of poet-haunted Warwickshire. For a long time we kept silence, turning over and pretending to read the morning's papers, till presently, flinging down the dull and wearisome times sheet, I sighed heavily, and leaning back, closed my eyes. I am truly very much distressed about all this, said Lucio then, with extreme gentleness and suavity. It seems to me that I am the adverse element in the affair. If Lady Sybil had never seen me. Why, then I should never have seen her, I responded bitterly. It was through you I met her first. True, and he eyed me thoughtfully. I am very unfortunately placed. It is almost as if I were to blame, though no one could be more innocent or well-intentioned than myself. He smiled, then went on very gravely. I really should avoid scandalous gossip if I were you. I do not speak of my own involuntary share in the disaster. What people say of me is quite immaterial, but for the lady's sake? For my own sake, I shall try to avoid it, I said brusquely, whereat his eyes glittered strangely. 
it is myself I have to consider most of all. I shall, as I hinted to you this morning, travel for a few years. Yes, go on a tiger hunting expedition in India, he suggested, or kill elephants in Africa. It is what a great many men do when their wives forget themselves. Several well-known husbands are abroad just now. Again, the brilliant, enigmatical smile flashed over his face, but I could not smile in answer. I stared moodily out of the window at the bare autumnal fields, past which the train flew, bare of harvest, stripped of foliage, like my own miserable life. Come in winter with me in Egypt, he continued. Come in my yacht, the flame. We will take her to Alexandria, and then do the Nile in a Dahabea, and forget that such frivolous dolls as women exist, except to be played with by us superior creatures and thrown aside. Egypt, the Nile, I murmured. Somehow the idea pleased me. Yes, why not? Why not indeed, he echoed. The proposal is agreeable to you, I am sure. Come and see the land of the old gods, the land where my princess used to live and torture the souls of men. Perhaps we may discover the remains of her last victim. Who knows? I avoided his gaze. The recollection of the horrible winged thing he persisted in imagining to be the transmigrated soul of an evil woman was repugnant to me. Almost I felt as if there were some subtle connection between that hateful creature and my wife Sybil. I was glad when the train reached London, and we, taking a hansom, were plunged into the very vortex of human life. The perpetual noise of traffic, the motley crowds of people, the shouting of newsboys and omnibus conductors. All this hubbub was grateful to my ears, and for a time at least distracted my thoughts. We lunched at the Savoy, and amused ourselves with noting the town noodles of fashion, the inane young man in the stocks of the stiff high collar, and wearing the manacles of equally stiff and exaggerated cuffs, a veritable prisoner in the dock of silly custom, the frivolous fool of a woman, painted and powdered, with false hair and dyed eyebrows, trying to look as much like a paid courtesan as possible. The elderly matron, skipping forward on high heels, and attempting, by the assumption of juvenile airs and graces, to cover up and conceal the obtrusive facts of a too obvious paunch and overlapping bosom. The would-be dandy and beau of seventy, strangely possessed by youthful desires, and manifesting the same by goat-like caperings at the heels of young married women. These and such like contemptible units of a contemptible social swarm passed before us like puppets at a country fair, and aroused us in turn to laughter or disdain. While we yet lingered over our wine, a man came in alone, and sat down at the table next to ours. He had with him a book, which, after giving his orders for luncheon, he at once opened at a marked place, and began to read with absorbed attention. I recognized the cover of the volume, and knew it to be Mavis Clare's differences. A haze floated before my sight, a sensation of rising tears was in my throat. I saw the fair face, earnest eyes, and sweet smile of Mavis, that women wearer of the laurel crown, that keeper of the lilies of purity and peace. Alas, those lilies! They were for me, des fleurs étranges, avec l'or air des sceptres d'ange, des tirs luminés pour doigts des séraphines, l'or parfum sont trop fort, tout ensemble et trop fine. I shaded my eyes with one hand, yet under that shade I felt that Lucio watched me closely. Presently he spoke softly, just as if he had read my thoughts. Considering the effect a perfectly innocent woman has on the mind of even an evil man, it's strange, isn't it, that there are so few of them? I did not answer. In the present day, he went on, there are a number of females clamoring like unnatural hens in a barnyard about their rights and wrongs. Their greatest right, their highest privilege, is to guide and guard the souls of men. This they, for the most part, throw away as worthless. Aristocratic women, royal women even, hand over the care of their children to hired attendants and inferiors, 
and then are surprised and injured if those children turn out to be either fools or blackguards. If I were controller of the state, I would make it a law that every mother should be bound to nurse and guard her children herself as nature intended, unless prevented by ill health, in which case she would have to get a couple of doctor's certificates to certify the fact. Otherwise, any woman refusing to comply with the law should be sentenced to imprisonment with hard labor. This would bring them to their senses. The idleness, wickedness, extravagance, and selfishness of women make men the bores and egoists they are. I looked up. The devil is in the whole business, I said bitterly. If women were good, men would have nothing to do with them. Look round you at what is called society. How many men there are who deliberately choose tainted women for their wives, and leave the innocent uncared for? Take Mavis Clare. Oh, you were thinking of Mavis Clare, were you? He rejoined, with a quick glance at me. But she would be a difficult prize for any man to win. She does not seek to be married, and she is not uncared for, since the whole world cares for her. That is a sort of impersonal love, I answered. It does not give her the protection such a woman needs, and ought to obtain. Do you want to become her lover? he asked with a slight smile. I'm afraid you've no chance. I? Her lover? Good God! I exclaimed, the blood rushing hotly to my face at the mere suggestion. What a profane idea! You are right, it is profane, he agreed, still smiling. It is though I should propose your stealing the sacramental cup from a church, with just this difference. You might succeed in running off with a cup, because it is only the church's property. But you would never succeed in winning Mavis Clare, inasmuch as she belongs to God. You know what Milton says. So dear to heaven is saintly chastity, that when a soul is found sincerely so, a thousand liveried angels lackey her driving far off each thing of sin and guilt, and in clear dream and solemn vision tell her of things which no gross ear can hear, till oft converse with heavenly habitants, begin to cast a beam on the outward shape, the unpolluted temple of the mind, and turns it by degrees to the soul's essence, till all be made immortal. He quoted the lines softly and with an exquisite gravity. That is what you see in Mavis Clare, he continued, that beam on the outward shape which turns it by degrees to the soul's essence, and which makes her beautiful without what is called beauty by lustful men. I moved impatiently and looked out from the window near which we were seated, at the yellow width of the flowing Thames below. Beauty, according to man's ordinary standard, pursued Lucio, means simply good flesh, nothing more flesh arranged prettily and roundly on the always ugly skeleton beneath, flesh daintily colored and soft to the touch, without scar or blemish, plenty of it, too, disposed in the proper places. It is the most perishable sort of commodity. An illness spoils it, a trying climate ruins it, age wrinkles it, death destroys it, but it is all the majority of men look for in their bargains with the fair sex. The most utter roué of sixty that ever trotted jauntily down Piccadilly, pretending to be thirty, expects, like Shylock, his pound, or several pounds of youthful flesh. The desire is neither refined nor intellectual, but there it is. And it is solely on this account that the ladies of the music hall become the tainted members and future mothers of the aristocracy. It does not need the ladies of the music hall to taint the already tainted, I said. True, and he looked at me with kindly commiseration. Let us put the whole mischief down to the new fiction. We rose then, having finished luncheon, and leaving the Savoy, we went on to Arthur's. Here we sat down in a quiet corner and began to talk of our future plans. It took me very little time to make up my mind. All quarters of the world were the same to me, and I was really indifferent as to where I went. Yet there is always something suggestive and fascinating about the idea of a first visit to Egypt, and I willingly agreed to accompany Lucio thither, and remain the winter. We will avoid society, he said. The well-bred, well-educated swagger people, who throw champagne bottles at the Sphinx, 
and think a donkey race ripping fun shall not have the honour of our company cairo was full of such dancing dolls so we will not stay there old nile has many attractions and lazy luxury on a dahabeah will soothe your overwrought nerves i suggest our leaving england within a week i consented and while he went over to a table and wrote some letters in preparation for our journey i looked through the day's papers there was nothing to read in them for though all the world's news palpitates into great britain on obediently throbbing electric wires each editor of each little pennyworth being jealous of every other editor of every other pennyworth only admits into his columns exactly what suits his politics or personally pleases his taste and the interests of the public at large are scarcely considered poor bamboozled patient public no wonder it is beginning to think that a halfpenny spent on a newspaper which is only purchased to be thrown away enough and more than enough i was still glancing up and down the tedious columns of the americanized pell-mell gazette and lucia was still writing when a page-boy entered with a telegram mr tempest yes and i snatched the yellow-covered missive and tore it open and read the few words it contained almost uncomprehendingly they ran thus return at once something alarming has happened afraid to act without you mavis clare a curious chill came over me the telegram fell from my hands on the table lucio took it up and glanced at it then regarding me steadfastly he said of course you must go you can catch the four forty train if you take a hansom and you i muttered my throat was dry and i could scarcely speak i'll stay at the grand and wait for news don't delay a moment miss clare would not have taken it upon herself to send this message unless there had been serious cause what do you think what do you suppose i began he stopped me by a slight imperative gesture i think nothing i suppose nothing i only urge you to start immediately come and almost before i realized it he had taken me with him out into the hall of the club where he helped me on with my coat gave me my hat and sent for a cab to take me to the railway station we scarcely exchanged farewells stupefied with the suddenness of the unexpected summons back to the home i had left in the morning as i thought for ever i hardly knew what i was doing or where i was going till i found myself alone in the train returning to warwickshire as fast as steam would bear me with the gloom of the deepening dusk around me and such a fear and horror at my heart as i dared not think of or define what was the something alarming that had happened how was it that mavis clare had telegraphed to me these and endless other questions tormented my brain and i was afraid to suggest answers to any of them when i arrived at the familiar station there was no one waiting to receive me so i hired a fly and was driven up to my own house just as the short evening deepened into night a low autumnal wind was sighing restlessly among the trees like a wandering soul in torment not a star shone in the black depths of the sky directly the carriage stopped a slim figure in white came out under the porch to meet me it was mavis her angel's face grave and pale with emotion it is you at last she said in a trembling voice thank god you have come End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I grasped her hands hard. What is it? I began. Then, looking round, I saw that the hall was full of panic stricken servants, some of whom came forward, confusedly murmuring together about being afraid and not knowing what to do. I motioned them back by a gesture and turned again to Mavis Clare tell me quick what is wrong we fear something has happened to lady sibyl she replied at once her rooms are locked and we cannot make her hear her maid got alarmed and ran over to my house to ask me what was best to be done i came at once and knocked and called but could get no response you know the windows are too high to reach from the ground there is no ladder on the premises long enough for the purpose 
and no one can climb up that side of the building. I begged some of the servants to break open the door by force, but they would not. They were all afraid, and I did not like to act on my own responsibility, so I telegraphed for you. I sprang away from her before she had finished speaking, and hurried upstairs at once. Outside, the door of the ante-room, which led into my wife's luxurious suite of apartments, I paused, breathless. Sybil! I cried. There was not a sound. Mavis had followed me, and stood by my side, trembling a little. Two or three of the servants had also crept up the stairs, and were clinging to the banisters, listening nervously. Sybil! I called again. Still, absolute silence. I turned round upon the waiting and anxious domestics with an assumption of calmness. Lady Sybil is probably not in her rooms at all, I said. She may have gone out unobserved. This door of the antechamber has a spring lock. It can easily get fast shut by the merest accident. Bring a strong hammer, or a crowbar, anything that will break it open. If you had had sense, you would have obeyed Miss Clare, and done this a couple of hours ago. And I waited with enforced composure, while my instructions were carried out as rapidly as possible. Two of the men-servants appeared with the necessary tools, and very soon the house resounded with clamor. Blow after blow was dealt upon the solid oaken door for some time without success. The spring-lock would not yield. Neither would the strong hinges give way. Presently, however, after ten minutes' hard labor, one of the finely carved panels was smashed in, then another, and springing over the debris, I rushed through the anteroom into the boudoir, then paused, listening and calling again, Sybil! No one followed me. Some indefinable instinct, some nameless dread held the servants back, and Mavis Clare as well. I was alone, and in complete darkness. Groping about, with my heart beating furiously, I sought for the ivory button in the wall, which would, at pressure, flood the rooms with electric light. But somehow I could not find it. My hand came in contact with various familiar things which I recognized by touch. Rare bits of china, bronzes, vases, pictures, costly trifles that were heaped up as I knew, in this particular apartment, with a lavish luxury and disregard of cost befitting a wanton eastern empress of old time. Cautiously feeling my way along, I started with terror to see, as I thought, a tall figure outline itself suddenly against the darkness, white, spectral, and luminous, a figure that, as I stared at it aghast, raised a pallid hand and pointed me forward with a menacing air of scorn. In my dazed horror at this apparition, or delusion, I stumbled over the heavy trailing folds of a velvet portier, and knew by this that I had passed from the boudoir into the adjoining bedroom. Again I stopped, calling, Sybil! But my voice had scarcely strength enough to raise itself above a whisper. Giddy and confused as I was, I remembered that the electric light in this room was fixed at the side of the toilet table, and I stepped hurriedly in that direction when all at once in the thick gloom I touched something clammy and cold like dead flesh, and brushed against a garment that exhaled faint perfume, and rustled at my touch with a silken sound. This alarmed me more thoroughly than the spectre I fancied I had just seen. I drew back shudderingly against the wall, and in so doing my fingers involuntarily closed on the polished ivory stud which, like a fairy talisman in modern civilization, emits radiance at the owner's will. I pressed it nervously. The light blazed forth through the rose-tinted shells which shaded its dazzling clearness, and showed me where I stood, within an arm's length of a strange, stiff, white creature that sat staring at itself in the silver-framed mirror with wide-open, fixed and glassy eyes. Sybil! I gasped. My wife! but the words died chokingly in my throat. Was it indeed my wife, this frozen statue of a woman, watching her own impassive image thus intently? I looked upon her wonderingly, doubtingly, as if she were some stranger. It took me time to recognize her features, and the bronze-gold darkness of her long hair 
which fell loosely about her in a lavish wealth of rippling waves. Her left hand hung limply over the arm of the chair in which, like some carven ivory goddess, she sat enthroned, and tremblingly, slowly, reluctantly, I advanced and took that hand. Cold as ice it lay in my palm, much as though it were a waxen model of itself. It glittered with jewels, and I studied every ring upon it with a curious, dull pertinacity, like one who seeks a clue to identity. That large turquoise in a diamond setting was a marriage gift from a duchess. That opal her father gave her, the lustrous circle of sapphires and brilliants surmounting her wedding ring, was my gift that ruby I seemed to know. Well, well, what a mass of sparkling value wasted on such fragile clay! I peered into her face, then at the reflection of that face in the mirror, and again I grew perplexed. Was it? Could it be Sybil after all? Sybil was beautiful. This dead thing had a devilish smile on its blue parted lips, and frenzied horror in its eyes. Suddenly something tense in my brain seemed to snap and give way. Dropping the chill fingers I held, I cried aloud, Mavis! Mavis Clare! In a moment she was with me. In a glance she comprehended all. Falling on her knees by the dead woman, she broke into a passion of weeping. Oh, poor girl! she cried. Oh, poor, unhappy, misguided girl! I stared at her gloomily. It seemed to me very strange that she should weep for sorrows not her own. There was a fire in my brain, a confused trouble in my thoughts. I looked at my dead wife with her fixed gaze and evil smile, sitting rigidly upright and robed in the mocking sheen of her rose silk peignoir, showered with old lace, after the costliest of Paris fashions. Then at the living, tender-souled, earnest creature, famed for her genius throughout the world, who knelt on the ground, sobbing over the stiffening hand on which so many rare gems glistened derisively. And an impulse rose in me stronger than myself, moving me to wild and clamorous speech. "'Get up, Mavis!' I cried. "'Do not kneel there. Go! Go out of this room, out of my sight. You do not know what she was, this woman whom I married. I deemed her an angel, but she was a fiend.' Yes, Mavis, a fiend. Look at her, staring at her own image in the glass. You cannot call her beautiful now. She smiles, you see, just as she smiled last night when... Ah, oh, you know nothing of last night. I tell you, go! And I stamped my foot almost furiously. This air is contaminated. It will poison you. The perfume of Paris and the effluvia of death intermingled are sufficient to breed a pestilence. Go quickly. Inform the household their mistress is dead. Have the blinds drawn down. Show all the exterior signs of decent and fashionable woe. And I began laughing deliriously. Tell the servants they may count upon expensive mourning. For all that money can do shall be done in homage to King Death. Let everyone in the place eat and drink as much as they can or will. And sleep or chatter as such menials love to do. Of hearses, graves, and sudden disasters but let me be left alone, alone with her. We have much to say to one another. White and trembling, Mavis rose up and stood gazing at me in fear and pity. Alone? she faltered. You are not fit to be alone. No, I am not fit to be, but I must be, I rejoined quickly and harshly. This woman and I loved, after the manner of brutes, and were wedded, or rather mated in a similar manner, though an archbishop blessed the pairing, and called upon heaven to witness its sanctity. Yet we parted ill friends, and dead though she is, I choose to pass the night with her. I shall learn much knowledge from her silence. Tomorrow the grave and the servants of the grave may claim her, but tonight she is mine. The girl's sweet eyes brimmed over with tears. Oh, you are too distracted to know what you are saying, she murmured. You do not even try to discover how she died. That is easy enough to guess, I answered quickly, and I took up a small, dark-colored bottle labeled Poison, which I had already perceived on the toilet table. This is uncorked and empty. 
What it contained, I do not know, but there must be an inquest, of course. People must be allowed to make money for themselves out of her ladyship's rash act. And see there? Here I pointed to some loose sheets of note-paper, covered with writing, and partially concealed by a filmy lace handkerchief, which had evidently been hastily thrown across them, and a pen and inkstand close by. There is some admirable reading prepared for me, doubtless. The last message from the beloved dead is sacred, Mavis Clare. Surely you, a writer of tender romances, can realize this, and realizing it, you will do as I ask you. Leave me. She looked at me in deep compassion, and slowly turned to go. God help you, she said sobbingly. God console you. At this, some demon in me broke loose and springing to her side I caught her hands in mine. "'Do not dare to talk of God,' I said in passionate accents. "'Not in this room, not in that presence. Why should you call curses down upon me? The help of God means punishment. The consolations of God are terrible. For strength must acknowledge itself weak before he will help it, and a heart must be broken before he will console it. But what do I say? I believe in no God. I believe in an unknown force that encompasses me and hunts me down to the grave, but nothing more. She thought as I do, and with reason, for what has God done for her? She was made evil from the first. A born snare of Satan. Something caught my breath here. I stopped, unable to utter another word. Mavis stared at me affrighted, and I stared back again. What is it? she whispered alarmedly. I struggled to speak. Finally, with difficulty, I answered her. Nothing. And I motioned her away with a gesture of entreaty. The expression of my face must have startled or intimidated her, I fancy, for she retreated hastily, and I watched her disappearing as if she were the phantom of a dream. Then, as she passed out through the boudoir, I drew closed the velvet portiere behind her and locked the intermediate door. This done, I went slowly back to the side of my dead wife. Now, Sybil, I said aloud, we are alone, you and I, alone with our own reflected images, you dead, and I living. You have no terrors for me in your present condition. Your beauty has gone. Your smile, your eyes, your touch, cannot stir me to a throb of the passion you craved, yet wearied of. What have you to say to me? I have heard that the dead can speak at times, and you owe me reparation. Reparation for the wrong you did me, the lie on which you based our marriage, the guilt you cherished in your heart. Shall I read your petition for forgiveness here? And I gathered up the written sheets of notepaper in one hand, feeling them rather than seeing them, for my eyes were fixed on the pallid corpse in its rose silk negligee and jewels, that gazed at itself so pertinaciously in that shining mirror. I drew a chair close to it and sat down, observing likewise the reflection of my own haggard face in the glass, beside that of the self-murdered woman. Turning presently, I began to scrutinize my immovable companion more closely, and perceived that she was very lightly clothed. Under the silk peignoir there was only a flowing white garment of soft, fine material, lavishly embroidered through which the statuesque contour of her rigid limbs could be distinctly seen. Stooping, I felt her heart. I knew it was pulseless, yet I half imagined I should feel its beat. As I withdrew my hand, something scaly and glistening caught my eye, and looking, I perceived Lucio's marriage gift circling her waist, the flexible emerald snake with its diamond crest and ruby eyes. It fascinated me, Coiled round that dead body, it seemed alive and sentient. If it had lifted its glittering head and hissed at me, I should scarcely have been surprised. I sat back for a moment in my chair, almost as rigid as the corpse beside me. I stared again, as the corpse stared always, into the mirror which pictured us both, we twain in one, as the sentimentalists aver of wedded folk, though in truth, it often happens that there are no two creatures in the world more widely separated than husband and wife. I heard stealthy movements and suppressed whisperings in the passage outside, and guessed that some of the servants were there watching and waiting. 
but I cared nothing for that. I was absorbed in the ghastly night interview I had planned for myself, and I so entered into the spirit of the thing that I turned on all the electric lamps in the room, besides lighting two tall clusters of shaded candles on either side of the toilet table. When all the surroundings were thus rendered as brilliant as possible, so that the corpse looked more livid and ghastly by comparison, I seated myself once more, and prepared to read the last message of the dead. Now, Sybil, I muttered, leaning forward a little, and noting with a morbid interest that the jaws of the corpse had relaxed a little within the last few minutes, and that the smile on the face was therefore more hideous. Confess your sins, for I am here to listen. Such dumb, impressive eloquence as yours deserves attention. A gust of wind fled round the house with a wailing cry. The windows shook and the candles flickered. I waited till every sound had died away, and then, with a glance at my dead wife, under the sudden impression that she had heard what I said and knew what I was doing, I began to read. End of chapter 34「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」「十五」It is best to make an end. The idea of death, which means annihilation, is very sweet to me. I am glad to feel that by my own will and act I can silence this uneasy throbbing of my heart, this turmoil and heat of my blood, this tortured aching of my nerves. Young as I am, I have no delight now in existence. I see nothing but my love's luminous eyes, his godlike features, his enthralling smile and these are lost to me. For a brief while he has been my world, life, and time. He has gone, and without him there is no universe. How could I endure the slow, wretched passing of hours, days, weeks, months, and years alone? Though it is better to be alone than in the dull companionship of the self-satisfied, complacent, and arrogant fool who is my husband. He has left me forever, so he says in a letter the maid brought to me an hour ago. It is quite what I expected of him. What man of his type could find pardon for a blow to his own amour propre? If he had studied my nature, entered into my emotions, or striven in the least to guide and sustain me, if he had shown me any sign of a great, true love, such as one sometimes dreams of and seldom finds, I think I should be sorry for him now. I should even ask his forgiveness for having married him. But he has treated me precisely as he might treat a paid mistress. That is, he has fed me, clothed me, and provided me with money and jewels in return for making me the toy of his passions. But he has not given me one touch of sympathy, one proof of self-denial or humane forbearance. Therefore, I owe him nothing. And now he... And my love, who will not be my lover, have gone away together. I am free to do as I will with this small pulse within me called life, which is, after all, only a thread, easily broken. There is no one to say me nay, or to hold my hand back from giving myself the final quietus. It is well I have no friends. It is good for me that I have probed the hypocrisy and social sham of the world and that I have mastered the following hard truths of life. That there is no love without lust, no friendship without self-interest, no religion without avarice, and no so-called virtue without its accompanying stronger vice. Who, knowing these things, would care to take part in them? On the verge of the grave I look back along the short vista of my years, and I see myself a child in this very place, this wooded willows mere. I can note how that life began, to which I am about to put an end. Pampered, petted, and spoilt, told that I must look pretty, and take pleasure in my clothes. I was even at the age of ten, 
capable of a certain amount of coquetry. Old roués, smelling of wine and tobacco, were eager to take me on their knees and pinch my soft flesh. They would press my innocent lips with their withered ones, withered and contaminated by the kisses of cocottes and soiled doves of the town. I have often wondered how it is these men can dare to touch a young child's mouth, knowing in themselves what beasts they are. I see my nurse, a trained liar and time-server, giving herself more airs than a queen, and forbidding me to speak to this child or that child, because they were beneath me. Then came my governess, full of a prurient prudery, as bad a woman in morals as ever lived, yet highly recommended, and with excellent references, and wearing an assumption of the strictest virtue, like many equally hypocritical clergymen's wives I have known. I soon found her out, for even as a child I was painfully observant, and the stories she and my mother's French maid used to tell, in lowered voices now and then, broken by coarse laughter, were sufficient to enlighten me as to her true character. Yet, beyond having a supreme contempt for the woman who practised religious austerity outwardly, and was at heart a rake, I gave small consideration to the difficult problem such a nature suggested. I lived. How strange it seems that I should be writing now of myself as past and done with. Yes, I lived in a dreamy, more or less idyllic state of mind, thinking without being conscious of thought, full of fancies concerning the flowers, trees, and birds, wishing for things of which I knew nothing, imagining myself a queen at times, and again a peasant. I was an omnivorous reader, and I was specially fond of poetry. I used to pore over the mystic verse of Shelley, and judged him then as a sort of demigod, and never, even when I knew all about his life, could I realize him as a man with a thin, shrieking, falsetto voice, and loose notions concerning women. But I am quite sure it was good for his fame that he was drowned in early youth, with so many melancholy and dramatic surroundings. It saved him, I consider, from a possibly vicious and repulsive old age. I adored Keats till I knew he had wasted his passion on a fanny brawn, and then the glamour of him vanished. I can offer no reason for this. I merely set down the fact. I made a hero of Lord Byron. In fact, he has always formed for me the only heroical type of poet. Strong in himself and pitiless in his love for women, he treated them for the most part as they merited. Considering the singular and unworthy specimens of the sex, it was his misfortune to encounter. I used to wonder, when reading these men's amorous lines, whether love would ever come my way and what beatific state of emotion I should then enjoy. Then came the rough awakening from all my dreams. Childhood melted into womanhood, and at sixteen I was taken up to town with my parents to know something of the ways and manners of society, before finally coming out. Oh, those ways and manners! I learnt them to perfection. Astonished at first, then bewildered, and allowed no time to form any judgment on what I saw. I was hurried through a general vague impression of things, such as I had never imagined or dreamed of. While I was yet lost in wonderment, and kept constantly in companionship with young girls of my own rank and age, who nevertheless seemed much more advanced in knowledge of the world than I, my father suddenly informed me that Willowsmere was lost to us, that he could not afford to keep it up, and that we should return there no more. Ha! Ah, what tears I shed! What a fury of grief consumed me! I did not then comprehend the difficult entanglements of either wealth or poverty. All I could realize was that the doors of my dear old home were closed upon me for ever. After that, I think I grew cold and hard in disposition. I had never loved my mother very dearly. In fact, I had seen very little of her as she was always away visiting, if not entertaining visitors, and she seldom had me with her, so that when she was suddenly struck down by a first shock of paralysis, it affected me but little. She had her doctors and nurses, I had my governess still with me, and my mother's sister, Aunt Charlotte, came to keep house for us. So I began to analyze society for myself, 
without giving any expression of my opinions on what I observed. I was not yet out, but I went everywhere where girls of my age were invited, and perceived things without showing that I had any faculty of perception. I cultivated a passionless and cold exterior, a listless, uninterested and frigid demeanour, for I discovered that this was accepted by many people as dullness or stupidity, and that by assuming such a character, certain otherwise crafty persons would talk more readily before me, and betray themselves and their vices unawares. Thus my social education began in grim earnest. Women of title and renown would ask me to their quiet teas, because I was what they were pleased to call a harmless girl, rather pretty but dull, and allow me to assist them in entertaining the lovers who called upon them while their husbands were out. I remember that on one occasion a great lady famous for two things, her diamonds and her intimacy with the queen, kissed her cavalier servente, a noted sporting earl, with considerable abandon in my presence. He muttered something about me. I heard it but his amorous mistress merely answered in a whisper, "'Oh, it's only Sybil Elton. She understands nothing.' Afterwards, however, when he had gone, she turned to me with a grin and remarked, "'You saw me kissed Bertie, didn't you? I often do. He's quite like my brother.' I made no reply. I only smiled vaguely, and the next day she sent me a valuable diamond ring, which I at once returned to her with a prim little note stating that I was much obliged, but that my father considered me too young as yet to wear diamonds. Why do I think of these trifles now, I wonder? Now, when I am about to take my leave of life and all its lies, there is a little bird singing outside my bedroom window, such a pretty creature. I suppose it is happy. It should be, as it is not human. The tears are in my eyes as I listen to its sweet warbling and think that it will be living and singing still today at sunset, when I am dead. That last sentence was mere sentiment, for I am not sorry to die. If I felt the least regret about it, I should not carry out my intention. I must resume my narrative, for it is an analysis I am trying to make of myself, to find out, if I can, whether there are no excuses to be found for my particular disposition whether it is not, after all, the education and training I have had that have made me what I am, or whether, indeed, I was born evil from the first. The circumstances that surrounded me did not, at any rate, tend to soften or improve my character. I had just passed my seventeenth birthday, when one morning my father called me into his library, and told me the true position of his affairs. I learned that he was crippled on all sides with debt, that he lived on advances that were trusted to him solely on the speculation that I, his only daughter, would make a sufficiently rich marriage to enable him to repay all loans with heavy interest. He went on to say that he hoped I would act sensibly, and that when any men showed indications of becoming suitors for my hand, I would, before encouraging them, inform him, in order that he might make strict enquiries as to their actual extent of fortune. I then understood for the first time that I was for sale. I listened in silence till he had finished. Then I asked him, Love, I suppose, is not to be considered in the matter? He laughed, and assured me it was much easier to love a rich man than a poor one, as I would find out after little experience. He added, with some hesitation, that to help make both ends meet, as the expenses of town life were considerable. He had arranged to take a young American lady under his charge, a Miss Diana Chesney, who wished to be introduced into English society, and who would pay two thousand guineas a year to him for that privilege, and for Aunt Charlotte's services as chaperone. I do not remember now what I said to him when I heard this. I know that my long-suppressed feelings broke out in a storm of fury and that for the moment he was completely taken aback by the force of my indignation. An American boarder in our house? It seemed to me as outrageous and undignified as the conduct of a person I once heard of, who, 
favoured by the Queen's patronage with free apartments in Kensington Palace, took from time to time, on the sly, an American or colonial paying guest, who adopted forthwith the address of Her Majesty's birthplace as her own, thus lowering the whole prestige of that historic habitation. My wrath, however, was useless. The bargain was arranged. My father, regardless of his proud lineage and the social dignity of his position, had degraded himself, in my opinion, to the level of a sort of superior lodging housekeeper, and from that time I lost all my former respect for him. Of course, it can be argued that I was wrong, that I ought to have honoured him for turning his name to monetary account by loaning it out as a protective shield and a panoply for an American woman without anything but the dollars of a vulgar railway king to back her up in society. But I could not see it in that light. I retreated into myself more than ever, and became more than pleasantly known for my coldness, reserve, and hauteur. Miss Chesney came and strove hard to be my friend, but she soon found that impossible. She is a good-hearted creature, I believe. But she is badly bred and badly trained, as all her compatriots are, more or less. Despite their smattering of a European education, I disliked her from the first and have spared no pains to show it. Yet I know she will be Countess of Elton as soon as it is decently possible, say, after the year's ceremonious mourning for my mother has expired, and perhaps three months' hypocritical wearing of black for me. My father believes himself to be still young and passably good-looking, and he is quite incapable of resisting the fortune she will bring him. When she took up her fixed abode in our house, and Aunt Charlotte became her paid chaperone, I seldom went out to any social gatherings, for I could not endure the idea of being seen in her companionship. I kept to my own room a great deal, and thus secluded read many books. All the fashionable fiction of the day passed through my hands, much to my gradual enlightenment, if not to my edification. One day, a day that is stamped on my memory as a kind of turning point in my life. I read a novel by a woman which I did not at first entirely understand. But on going over some of its passages a second time, all at once its horrible lasciviousness flashed upon me, and filled me with such genuine disgust that I flung it on the ground in a fit of loathing and contempt. Yet I had seen it praised in all the leading journals of the day. Its obscenities were hinted at as daring, its vulgarities were quoted as brilliant wit. In fact, so many laudatory columns were written about it in the press that I resolved to read it again. Encouraged by the literary censors of the time, I did so, and little by little the insidious abomination of it filtered into my mind and stayed there. I began to think about it, and by and by found pleasure in thinking about it. I sent for other books by the same tainted hand, and my appetite for that kind of prurient romance grew keener. At this particular juncture, as chance or fate would have it, an acquaintance of mine, the daughter of a marchioness, a girl with large black eyes and those full protruding lips which remind one unconsciously of a swine's snout, brought me two or three odd volumes of the poems of Swinburne always devoted to poetry, and considering it to be the highest of the arts. And up to that period having been ignorant of this writer's work, I turned over the books with eagerness, expecting to enjoy the usual sublime emotions, which it is the privilege and glory of the poet to inspire in mortals less divinely endowed than himself, and who turn to him for help to climb beyond the highest peaks of time, now I should like, if I could do so, to explain clearly the effect of this satyr songster upon my mind, for I believe there are many women to whom his works have been deadlier than the deadliest poison, and far more soul-corrupting than any book of Zola's or the most pernicious of modern French writers. At first I read the poems quickly, with a certain pleasure in the musical swing and jangle of rhythm, and without paying much attention to the subject matter of the verse. But presently, as though a lurid blaze of lightning had stripped a fair tree of its adorning leaves, 
my senses suddenly perceived the cruelty and sensuality concealed under the ornate language and persuasive rhymes and for a moment i paused in my reading and closed my eyes shuddering and sick at heart was human nature as base and abandoned as this man declared it to be was there no god but lust were men and women lower and more depraved in their passions and appetites than the very beasts i mused and dreamed i pored over the low venerous faustine and anactoria till i felt myself being dragged down to the level of the mind that conceived such outrages to decency i drank in the poet's own fiendish contempt of god and i read over and over again his verses before a crucifix till i knew them by heart till they rang in my brain as persistently as any nursery jingle and drove my thoughts into as haughty a scorn of christ and his teachings as any unbelieving jew it is nothing to me now now when without hope or faith or love i am about to take the final plunge into eternal darkness and silence but for the sake of those who have the comfort of a religion i ask why in a so-called christian country is such a hideous blasphemy as before a crucifix allowed to circulate among the people without so much as one reproof from those who elect themselves judges of literature i have seen many noble writers condemned unheard many have been accused of blasphemy whose works tend quite the other way but these lines are permitted to work their cruel mischief unchecked and the writer of them is glorified as though he were a benefactor to mankind i quote them here from bitter memory that i may not be deemed as exaggerating their nature so when our souls look back to thee they sicken seeing against thy side too foul to speak of or to see the leprous likeness of a bride whose kissing lips through his lips grown leave their god rotten to the bone when we would see thee man and know what heart thou hadst toward man indeed lo thy blood blackened altars lo the lips of priests that pray and feed while their own hell's worm curls and licks the poison of the crucifix thou badest the children come to thee what children now but curses come what manhood in that god can be who sees their worship and is dumb no soul that lived loved wrought and died is this their carrion crucified nay if their god and thou be one if thou and this thing be the same thou shouldst not look upon the sun the sun grows haggard at thy name come down be done with cease give o'er hide thyself strive not be no more from the time of reading this i used to think of christ as carrion crucified if i ever thought at all i found out that no one had ever reproached swinburne for this term that it did not interfere with his chances for the laureateship, and that not even a priest of the church had been bold-spoken or zealous enough in his master's cause to publicly resent the shameless outrage. So I concluded that Swinburne must, after all, be right in his opinions, and I followed the lazy and unthinking course of social movement spending my days with such literature as stored my brain with the complete knowledge of things evil and pernicious. Whatever soul I had in me was killed. The freshness of my mind was gone. Swinburne, among others, had helped me to live mentally, if not physically, through such a phase of vice as had poisoned my thoughts for ever. I understand there is some vague law in existence about placing an interdiction on certain books considered injurious to public morals. If there is such a rule, it has been curiously lax concerning the author of Anactoria, who, by virtue of being a poet, passes unquestioned into many a home, carrying impure suggestion into minds that were once cleanly and simple. As for me, after I had studied his verse to my heart's content, nothing remained sacred i judged men as beasts and women as little better i had no belief in honor virtue or truth and i was absolutely indifferent to all things save one and that
that was my resolve to have my own way as far as love was concerned. I might be forced to marry without love, for purely money considerations, but all the same, love I would have, or what I called love, not an ideal passion by any means, but precisely what Mr. Swinburne and a few of the most praised novelists of the day had taught me to consider as love. I began to wonder when and how I should meet my lover, such thoughts as I had at this time, indeed, would have made moralists stare and uplift their hands in horror. But to the exterior world I was the very pink and pattern of maidenly decorum, reserve, and pride. Men desired but feared me, for I never gave them any encouragement, seeing as yet none among them who I deemed worthy of such love as I could give. The majority resembled carefully trained baboons, respectably clothed and artistically shaven, but nevertheless all with the spasmodic grin, the leering eye, and the uncouth gestures of the hairy woodland monster. When I was just eighteen I came out in earnest. That is, I was presented at court with all the foolish and farcical pomp practiced on such occasions. I was told before going that it was a great and necessary thing to be presented that it was a guarantee of position, and above all, of reputation. The queen received none whose conduct was not rigidly correct and virtuous. What humbug it all was! I laughed then, and I can smile now to think of it. Why, the very woman who presented me had two illegitimate sons, unknown to her lawful husband, and she was not the only playful sinner in the court comedy. Some women were there that day, whom since even I would not receive, so openly infamous are their lives and characters, yet they make their demure curtsies before the throne at stated times, and assume to be the very patterns of virtue and austerity. Now and then it chances in the case of an exceedingly beautiful woman, of whom all the others are jealous, that for her little slips she is selected as an example and excluded from court, while her plainer sisters, though sinning seventy times seven against all the laws of decency and morality, are still received. But otherwise, there is very little real care exercised as to the character and prestige of the women whom the queen receives. If any one of them is refused, it is certain she adds to her social enormities, the greater crime of being beautiful, otherwise there would be no one to whisper away her reputation. I was what is called a success on my presentation day. That is, I was stared at and openly flattered by certain members of my sex who were too old and ugly to be jealous, and treated with insolent contempt by those who were young enough to be my rivals. There was a great crush to get into the throne room, and some of the ladies used rather strong language. One duchess, just in front of me, said to her companion, Do as I do, kick out! bruise their shins for them as hard as you can we shall get on faster then this choice remark was accompanied by the grin of a fishwife and the stare of a drab yet it was a great lady who spoke not a transatlantic importation but a woman of distinguished lineage and connection her observation however was only one out of many similar speeches which i heard on all sides of me during the distinguished melee a thoroughly ill-mannered crush, which struck me as supremely vulgar, and totally unfitting the dignity of our sovereign's court. When I curtsied before the throne at last, and saw the majesty of the empire, represented by a kindly-faced old lady, looking very tired and bored, whose hand was as cold as ice when I kissed it, I was conscious of an intense feeling of pity for her in her high estate, who would be a monarch to be doomed to the perpetual receiving of a company of fools? I got through my duties quickly, and returned home, more or less wearied out and disgusted with the whole ceremony. The next day I found that my debut had given me the position of a leading beauty, or in other words, that I was now formally put up for sale. That is really what is meant by being presented and coming out. These are the fancy terms of one's parental auctioneer. My life now passed in dressing, having my photograph taken, giving sittings to aspiring fashionable painters, 
and being inspected by men with a view to matrimony, who was distinctly understood in society that I was not to be sold under a certain figure per annum, and the price was too high for most would-be purchasers. How sick I grew of my constant exhibition in the marriage market! What contempt and hatred was fostered in me for the mean and pitiable hypocrisies of my set! I was not long in discovering that money was the chief motive power of all social success, that the proudest and highest personages in the world could be easily gathered together under the roof of any vulgar plebeian who happened to have enough cash to feed and entertain them. As an example of this, I remember a woman, ugly, passé, and squint-eyed, who, during her father's life, was only allowed about half a crown a week as pocket money up to her fortieth year, and who, when that father died, leaving her in possession of half his fortune, the other half going to illegitimate children of whom she had never heard, he having always posed as a pattern of immaculate virtue, suddenly blossomed out as a leader of fashion, and succeeded, through cautious scheming and ungrudging toadyism, in assembling some of the highest people in the land under her roof. Ugly and passé though she was, and verging toward fifty, with neither grace, wit, nor intelligence, through the power of her cash alone, she invited royal dukes and titles generally to her dinners and dances, and it is to their shame that they actually accepted her invitations. Such voluntary degradations on the part of really well-connected people I have never been able to understand. It is not as if they were actually in want of food or amusement, for they have a sure fit of both every season, and it seems to me that they ought to show a better example than to flock in crowds to the entertainments of a mere uninteresting and ugly nobody, just because she happens to have money. I never entered her house myself, though she had the audacity to invite me. I learned, moreover, that she had promised a friend of mine a hundred guineas if she could persuade me to make one appearance in her rooms. For my renown as a beauty, combined with my pride and exclusiveness, would have given her parties a prestige greater than even royalty could bestow. She knew that, and I knew that, and knowing it, never condescended to so much as notice her by a bow. But though I took a certain satisfaction in thus revenging myself on the atrocious vulgarity of parvenus and social interlopers, I grew intensely weary of the monotony and emptiness of what fashionable folks call amusement, and presently, falling ill of a nervous fever, I was sent down to the seaside for a few weeks' change of air with a young cousin of mine, a girl I rather liked because she was so different to myself. Her name was Eva Maitland. She was but sixteen and extremely delicate. Poor little soul! She died two months before my marriage. She and I, and a maid to attend us, went down to Cromer, and one day, sitting on the cliffs together, she asked me timidly, if I knew an author named Mavis Clare. I told her no, whereupon she handed me a book called The Wings of Psyche. Do read it, she said earnestly. It will make you feel so happy. I laughed. The idea of a modern author writing anything to make one feel happy seemed to me quite ludicrous, the aim of most of them being to awaken a disgust of life and a hatred of one's fellow creatures. However, to please Eva, I read the wings of Psyche, and if it did not make me actually happy, it moved me to a great wonder and deep reverence for the woman writer of such a book. I found out all about her, that she was young, good-looking, of a noble character and unblemished reputation, and that her only enemies were the press critics. This last point was so much in her favor with me that I at once bought everything she had ever written, and her works became as it were, my haven of rest. Her theories of life are strange, poetic, ideal, and beautiful, though I have not been able to accept them or work them out in my own case. I have always felt soothed and comforted for a while in the very act of wishing they were true, and the woman is like her books, strange, poetic, ideal, and beautiful. How odd it is to think that she is within ten minutes' walk of me now. I could send for her if I liked, and tell her all, but she would prevent me carrying out my resolve. She would cling to me woman-like and kiss me, 
and hold my hands and say, No, Sibyl, no, you are not yourself. You must come to me and rest. An odd fancy has seized me. I will open my window and call her very gently. She might be in the garden coming here to see me. And if she hears and answers, who knows? Why, perhaps my ideas may change, and fate itself may take a different course. Well, I have called her. I have sent her name Mavis softly out onto the sunshine and still air three times, and only a little brown namesake of hers, a thrush, swinging on a branch of fir, answered me with his low autumnal piping. Mavis, she will not come. Today, God will not make her his messenger. She cannot guess. She does not know this tragedy of my heart, greater and more poignant than all the tragedies of fiction. If she did know me as I am, I wonder what she would think of me. Let me go back to the time when love came to me. Love, ardent, passionate, and eternal. Ah, what wild joy thrilled through me! What mad ecstasy fired my blood! What delirious dreams possessed my brain! I saw Lucio, and it seemed as if the splendid eyes of some great angel had flashed a glory in my soul. With him came his friend, the foil to his beauty, the arrogant, self-satisfied fool of a millionaire, Geoffrey Tempest, he who bought me, and who by virtue of his purchase is entitled by law to call himself my husband. Here I paused in my reading and looked up. The dead woman's eyes appeared now to regard me as steadily as herself in the opposite mirror. The head was a little more dropped forward on the breast, and the whole face very nearly resembled that of the late Countess of Elton, when the last shock of paralysis had rendered her hideous disfigurement complete. "'To think I loved that!' I said aloud, pointing at the corpse's ghastly reflection. "'Fool that I was indeed! As great a fool as all men are who barter their lives for the possession of a woman's mere body! Why, if there were any life after death, if such a creature had a soul that it all resembled this poisoned clay, the very devils might turn away aghast from such a loathly comrade. The candles flickered and the dead face seemed to smile. A clock chimed in the adjoining room, but I did not count the hour. I merely arranged the manuscript pages I held more methodically and read on with renewed attention. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of The Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From the moment I saw Lucio Rimenez, went on Sibyl's dying speech, I abandoned myself to love and the desire of love. I had heard of him before from my father, who had, as I learned to my shame, been indebted to him for monetary assistance. On the very night we met, my father told me quite plainly that now was my chance to get settled in life. Marry Rimenez or Tempest, whichever you can most easily catch, he said. The prince is fabulously wealthy, but he keeps up a mystery about himself, and no one knows where he actually comes from. Besides which, he dislikes women. Now, Tempest has five millions and seems an easy-going fool. I should say you had better go for Tempest. I made no answer, and gave no promise either way. I soon found out, however, that Lucio did not intend to marry, and I concluded that he preferred to be the lover of many women instead of the husband of one. I did not love him any the less for this. I only resolved that I would at least be one of those who were happy enough to share his passion. I married the man Tempest, feeling that like many women I knew, I should, when safely wedded, have greater liberty of action. I was aware that most modern men prefer an amour with a married woman to any other kind of liaison, and I thought Lucio would have readily yielded to the plan I had preconceived. But I was mistaken, and out of this mistake comes all my perplexity, pain, and bewilderment. 
I cannot understand why my love, beloved beyond all word or thought, should scorn me and repulse me with such bitter loathing. It is such a common thing nowadays for a married woman to have her own lover, apart from her husband, de convenance. The writers of books advise it. I have seen the custom not only excused but advocated over and over again in long and scientific articles that are openly published in leading magazines. Why, then, should I be blamed or my desires considered criminal? As long as no public scandal is made, what harm is done? I cannot see it. It is not as if there were a God to care. The scientists say there is no God. I was very startled just now. I thought I heard Lucio's voice calling me. I have walked through the rooms looking everywhere, and I opened my door to listen, but there is no one. I am alone. I have told the servant not to disturb me till I ring. I shall never ring. Now I come to think of it, it is singular that I have never known who Lucio really is. A prince, he says, and that I can well believe though truly princes nowadays are so plebeian and common in look and bearing, that he seems too great to belong to so shabby a fraternity. From what kingdom does he come? To what nation does he belong? These are questions which he never answers, save equivocally. I pause here and look at myself in the mirror. How beautiful I am! I note with admiration the deep and dewy luster of my eyes and their dark, silky fringes. I see the delicate colouring of my cheeks and lips, the dear rounded chin with its pretty dimple, the pure lines of my slim throat and snowy neck, the glistening wealth of my long hair. All this was given to me for the attraction and luring of men. But my love, whom I love with all this living, breathing, exquisite being of mine, can see no beauty in me, and rejects me with such scorn as pierces my very soul. I have knelt to him, I have prayed to him, I have worshipped him in vain. Hence it comes that I must die. Only one thing, he said, that had the sound of hope, though the utterance was fierce, and his looks were cruel. Patience, he whispered, we shall meet ere long. What did he mean? What possible meeting can there be now, when death must close the gate of life, and even love would come too late? I have unlocked my jewel case, and take it from it the deadly thing secreted there, a poison that was entrusted to me by one of the physicians who lately attended my mother. Keep this under lock and key, he said, and be sure that it is used only for external purposes. There is sufficient in this flask to kill ten men, if swallowed by mistake. I look at it wonderingly. It is colorless, and there is not enough to fill a teaspoon. Yet, it will bring down upon me an eternal darkness, and close up forever the marvelous scenes of the universe. So little, to do so much. I have fastened Lucio's wedding gift round my waist the beautiful snake of jewels that clings to me as though it were charged with an embrace from him. Ah, would I could cheat myself into so pleasing a fancy. I am trembling, but not with cold or fear. It is simply an excitation of the nerves, an instinctive recoil of flesh and blood at the near prospect of death. How brilliantly the sun shines through my window, its callous golden stare has watched so many tortured creatures die without so much as a cloud to dim its radiance by way of the suggestion of pity. If there were a god, I fancy he would be like the sun, glorious, changeless, unapproachable, beautiful, but pitiless. Out of all the various types of human beings, I think I hate the class called poets most. I used to love them and believe in them, but I know them now to be mere weavers of lies, builders of cloud castles in which no throbbing life can breathe, no weary heart find rest. Love is their chief motive. They either idealize or degrade it. 
and of the love we women long for most, they have no conception. They can only sing of brute passion or ethical impossibilities, of the mutual great sympathy, the ungrudging patient tenderness that should make love lovely. They have no sweet things to say. Between their strained aestheticism and unbridled sensualism, my spirit has been stretched on the rack and broken on the wheel. I should think many a wretched woman wrecked among love's disillusions must curse them as I do. I am ready now, I think. There is nothing more to say. I offer no excuses for myself. I am, as I was made, a proud and rebellious woman, self-willed and sensual, seeing no fault in free love and no crime in conjugal infidelity. And if I am vicious, I can honestly declare that my vices have been encouraged and fostered in me by most of the literary teachers of my time. I married, as most women of my set marry, merely for money. I loved, as most women of my set love, for mere bodily attraction. I die, as most women of my set will die, either naturally or self-slain, in utter atheism, rejoicing that there is no God and no hereafter. I had the poison in my hand a moment ago, ready to take, when I suddenly felt someone approaching me stealthily from behind, and glancing up quickly at the mirror, I saw my mother, her face, hideous and ghastly as it had been in her last illness, was reflected in the glass, peering over my shoulder. I sprang up and confronted her. She was gone. And now I am shivering with cold, and I feel a chill dampness on my forehead. Mechanically, I have soaked a handkerchief with perfume from one of the silver bottles on the dressing table, and have passed it across my temples to help me recover from this sick swooning sensation. To recover? How foolish of me, seeing I am about to die! I do not believe in ghosts, yet I could have sworn my mother was actually present just now. Of course, it was an optical delusion of my own feverish brain. The strong scent on my handkerchief reminds me of Paris. I can see the shop where I bought this particular perfume, and the well-dressed doll of a man who served me, with his little waxed moustache and his indefinable French manner of conveying a speechless personal compliment while making out a bill. Laughing at this recollection, I see my face radiate in the glass, my eyes flash into vivid luster, and the dimples near my lips come and go, giving my expression an enchanting sweetness. Yet, in a few hours, this loveliness will be destroyed, and in a few days the worms will twine where the smile is now. An idea has come upon me that perhaps I ought to say a prayer. It would be hypocritical, but conventional. To die fashionably, one ought to concede a few words to the church. And yet, to kneel down with clasped hands and tell an inactive, unsympathetic, selfish, paid community called the church, that I am going to kill myself for the sake of love and love's despair, and that therefore I humbly implore its forgiveness for the act, seems absurd. As absurd as to tell the same thing to a non-existent deity. I suppose the scientists do not think what a strange predicament their advanced theories put the human mind in at the hour of death. They forget that on the brink of the grave thoughts come that will not be gainsaid, and that cannot be appeased by a learned thesis. However, I will not pray. It would seem to myself cowardly that I, who have never said my prayers since I was a child, should run over them now in a foolish, babbling attempt to satisfy the powers invisible. I could not, out of sheer association, appeal to Mr. Swinburne's crucified carrion. Besides, I do not believe in the powers invisible at all. I feel that once outside this life, the rest, as Hamlet said, is silence. I have been staring dreamily, and in a sort of stupefaction, 
at the little poison flask in my hand. It is quite empty now. I have swallowed every drop of the liquid it contained. I took it quickly and determinately as one takes nauseous medicine. Without allowing myself another moment of time for thought or hesitation, it tasted acrid and burning on my tongue, but at present I am not conscious of any strange or painful result. I shall watch my face in the mirror and trace the oncoming of death. This will be at any rate a new sensation, not without interest. My mother is here, here with me in this room. She is moving about restlessly, making wild gestures with her hands and trying to speak. She looks as she did when she was dying, only more alive, more sentient. I have followed her up and down, but am unable to touch her. She eludes my grasp. I have called her, Mother! Mother! but no sound issues from her white lips. Her face is so appalling that I was seized with a convulsion of terror a moment ago, and fell on my knees before her, imploring her to leave me. And then she paused in her gliding to and fro, and smiled. What a hideous smile it was! I think I lost consciousness, for I found myself lying on the ground, a sharp and terrible pain running through me made me spring to my feet, and I bit my lips till they bled, lest I should scream aloud with the agony I suffered and so alarm the house. When the paroxysm passed, I saw my mother standing quite near to me, dumbly watching me with a strange expression of wonder and remorse. I tottered past her and back to this chair where I now sit. I am calmer now and I am able to realize that she is only the phantom of my own brain, that I fancy she is here, while knowing she is dead. Torture indescribable has made of me a writhing, moaning, helpless creature for the past few minutes. Truly that drug was deadly. The pain is horrible, horrible. It has left me quivering in every limb, and palpitating in every nerve. Looking at my face in the glass, I see that it has already altered. It is drawn and livid. All the fresh rose tint of my lips has gone. My eyes protrude unnaturally. There are dull blue marks at the corners of my mouth and in the hollows of my temples, and I observe a curious quick pulsation in the veins of my throat. Be my torment what it will, now there is no remedy, and I am resolved to sit here and study my own features to the end. The reaper whose name is Death must surely be near, ready to gather my long hair in his skeleton hand like a sheaf of ripe corn. My poor beautiful hair! How I have loved its glistening ripples and brushed it and twined it round my fingers, and how soon it will lie like a dank weed in the mold. A devouring fire is in my brain and body. I am burning with heat and parched with thirst. I have drunk deep draughts of cold water, but this has not relieved me. The sun glares in upon me like an open furnace. I have tried to rise and close the blind against it, but I find I have no force to stand upright. The strong radiance blinds me. The silver toilet boxes on my table glitter like so many points of swords. It is by a powerful effort of will that I am able to continue writing. My head is swimming round, and there is a choking sensation in my throat. A moment since I thought I was dying. Torn asunder, as it were, by the most torturing pangs, I could have screamed for help, and would have done so, had a voice been left me. But I cannot speak above a whisper. I mutter my own name to myself, Sybil, Sybil, and can scarcely hear it. My mother stands beside me apparently waiting. A little while ago I thought I heard her say, Come, Sybil, come to your chosen lover. Now I am conscious of a great silence everywhere. A numbness has fallen upon me, and a delicious respite from pain. But I see my face in the glass, and know it is the face of the dead. It will soon be all over, a few more uneasy breathings, and I shall be at rest. I am glad for the world and I were never good friends. I am sure that if we could know, before we were born, 
what life really is. We should never take the trouble to live. A horrible fear has suddenly beset me. What if death were not what the scientists deem it? Suppose it were another form of life. Can it be that I am losing reason and courage together? Or what is this terrible misgiving that is taking possession of me? I begin to falter. A strange sense of horror is creeping over me. I have no more physical pain, but something worse than pain oppresses me. A feeling that I cannot define. I am dying, dying. I repeat this to myself for comfort. In a little while I shall be deaf and blind and unconscious. Why then is the silence around me now broken through by sound? I listen, and I hear distinctly the clamor of wild voices mingled with a sudden jar and roll as of distant thunder. My mother stands closer to me. She is stretching out her hand to touch mine. Oh, God, let me write, write while I can. Let me yet hold fast the thread which fastens me to earth. Give me time, time before I drift out, lost in yonder blackness and flame. Let me write for others the awful truth as I see it. There is no death, none, none. I cannot die. I am passing out of my body. I am being wrenched away from it inch by inch in inexplicable mystic torture. But I am not dying. I am being carried forward into a new life, vague and vast. I see a new world full of dark forms, half-shaped yet shapeless. They float toward me, beckoning me on. I am actively conscious. I hear, I think, I know. Death is a mere human dream, a comforting fancy. It has no real existence. There is nothing in the universe but life. Oh, hideous misery! I cannot die! In my mortal body I can scarcely breathe. The pen I try to hold writes of itself, rather than through my shaking hand. But these pangs are the throes of birth, not death. I hold back. With all the force of my soul I strive not to plunge into that black abyss I see before me. But my mother drags me with her. I cannot shake her off. I hear her voice now. She speaks distinctly and laughs as though she wept. Come, Sibyl, soul of the child I bore. Come and meet your lover. Come and see upon whom you fixed your faith. Soul of the woman I trained. Return to that from whence you came. Still I hold back. Nude and trembling I stare into a dark void. And now there are wings about me. Wings of fiery scarlet. They fill the space, they enfold me, they propel me, they rush past and whirl around me, stinging me as with flying arrows and showers of hail. Let me write on, write on, with this dead fleshly hand. One moment more time, dread God. One moment more to write the truth, the terrible truth of death, whose darkest secret, life, is unknown to men. I live. A new, strong, impetuous vitality possesses me, though my mortal body is nearly dead. Faint gasps and weak shudderings affect it still, and I, outside it and no longer of it, propel its perishing hand to write these final words. I live! To my despair and horror, to my remorse and agony, I live! Oh, the unspeakable misery of this new life! And worst of all, God, whom I doubted, God, whom I was taught to deny, this wronged, blasphemed, and outraged God exists, and I could have found him had I chosen. This knowledge is forced upon me as I am torn from hence. It is shouted at me by a thousand wailing voices. Too late, too late. The scarlet wings beat me downward. These strange, half-shapeless forms close round and drive me onward to a further darkness amid wind and fire. Serve me, dead hand, once more, ere I depart. My tortured spirit must seize and compel you to write down this thing unnameable, that earthly eyes may read, and earthly souls take timely warning. I know at last whom I have loved, whom I have chosen, whom I have worshipped, O oh God, have mercy! I know who claims my worship now and drags me into yonder rolling world of flame. His name is... 
Here the manuscript ended, incomplete and broken off abruptly, and there was a blot on the last sentence, as though the pen had been violently wrenched from the dying fingers and hastily flung down. The clock in the west room again chimed the hour. I rose stiffly from my chair, trembling. My self-possession was giving way, and I began to feel at last unnerved. I looked askance at my dead wife. She, who with a superhuman dying effort had declared herself to be yet alive, who in some imaginable strange way had seemingly written after death, in a frantic desire to make some appalling declaration which nevertheless remained undeclared. The rigid figure of the corpse had now real terrors for me. I dared not touch it. I scarcely dared look at it. In some dim, inscrutable fashion, I felt as if scarlet wings environed it, beating me down, yet pressing me on. Me too, in my turn. With the manuscript gathered close in my hand, I bent nervously forward to blow out the wax lights on the toilet table. I saw on the floor the handkerchief odorous with the French perfume the dead woman had written of. I picked it up and placed it near her, where she sat, grinning hideously at her own mirrored ghastliness. The flash of the jeweled serpent round her waist caught my eyes anew as I did this, and I stared for a moment at its green glitter, dumbly fascinated. Then moving stealthily, with the cold sweat pouring down my back, and every pulse in me rendered feeble by sheer horror, I turned to leave the room. As I reached the portiere and lifted it, some instinct made me look back at the dread picture of the leading society beauty sitting stark and livid pale before her own stark and livid pale image in the glass. What a fashion plate she would make now, I thought, for a frivolous and hypocritical lady's paper. You say you are not dead, Sibyl, I muttered aloud. Not dead, but living. Then, if you are alive, where are you, Sibyl? Where are you? The heavy silence seemed fraught with fearful meaning. The light of the electric lamps on the corpse and on the shimmering silk garment wrapped round it appeared unearthly and the perfume in the room had a grave-like earthy smell. A panic seized me, and dragging frantically at the portiere till all its velvet folds were drawn thickly together, I made haste to shut out from my sight the horrible figure of the woman whose bodily fairness I had loved in the customary way of sensual men, and left her without so much as a pardoning or pitying kiss of farewell on the cold brow. For, after all, I had myself to think of, and she was dead. End of chapter 36、chapter、37 of The Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I pass over all the details of polite shock, affected sorrow, and feigned sympathy of society at my wife's sudden death. No one was really grieved about it. Men raised their eyebrows, shrugged their shoulders, lit extra cigarettes, and dismissed the subject as too unpleasant and depressing to dwell upon. Women were glad of the removal of a too beautiful and too much admired rival, and the majority of fashionable folk delighted in having something thrilling to talk about in the tragic circumstances of her end. As a rule, people are seldom or never unselfish enough to be honestly sorry for the evanishment of some leading or brilliant figure from their midst. The vacancy leaves room for the pushing in of smaller fry. Be sure that if you are unhappily celebrated for either beauty, wit, intellect, or all three together, Half society wishes you dead already, and the other half tries to make you as wretched as possible while you are alive. To be missed at all when you die, someone must love you very deeply and unselfishly, and deep unselfish love is rarer to find among mortals than a pearl in a dustbin. Thanks to my abundance of cash, everything concerning Sybil's suicide was admirably managed. In consideration of her social position as an earl's daughter, two doctors certified, on my paying them very handsome fees, that hers was a death by misadventure, 
namely, through taking an accidental overdose of a powerful sleeping draught. It was the best report to make, and the most respectable. It gave the penny press an opportunity of moralizing on the dangers that lurked in sleeping drafts generally, and Tom, Dick, and Harry all wrote letters to their favorite periodicals, signing their names in full, giving their opinions as to the nature of sleeping drafts, so that for a week at least the ordinary dullness of the newspapers was quite enlivened by ungrammatical gratis copy. The conventionalities of law, decency, and order were throughout scrupulously observed and complied with. Everybody was paid, which was the chief thing, and everybody was, I believe, satisfied with what they managed to make out of the death payment. The funeral gave joy to the souls of all undertakers. It was so expensive and impressive. The florist's trade gained something of an impetus by the innumerable orders received for wreaths and crosses made of the costliest flowers. When the coffin was carried to the grave, it could not be seen for the load of blossoms that covered it, and amid all the cards and loving tokens and farewell dearests and not lost but gone befores that ticketed the white masses of lilies, gardenias, and roses which were supposed to symbolize the innocence and sweetness of the poisoned corpse they were sent to adorn, there was not one honest regret, not one unfeigned expression of true sorrow. Lord Elton made a sufficiently striking figure of dignified parental woe, but on the whole I think he was not sorry for his daughter's death, since the only opposing obstacle to his marriage with Diana Chesney was now removed. I fancy Diana herself was sorry, so far as such a frivolous little American could be sorry for anything. Perhaps, however, it would be more correct to say that she was frightened. Sybil's sudden end startled and troubled her, but I am not sure that it grieved her. There is such a difference between unselfish grief and the mere sense of nervous personal shock. Miss Charlotte Fitzroy took the news of her niece's death with that admirable fortitude which frequently characterizes religious spinsters of a certain age. She put by her knitting, said, God's will be done, and sent for her favorite clergyman. He came, stayed with her some hours drinking strong tea, and the next morning at church administered to her communion. This done, Miss Fitzroy went on the blameless and even tenor of her way, wearing the same virtuously distressed expression as usual, and showed no further sign of feeling. I, as the afflicted millionaire husband, was no doubt the most interesting figure on the scene. I was, I know, very well got up, thanks to my tailor, and to the affectionate care of the chief undertaker, who handed me my black gloves on the day of the funeral with servile solicitude. But in my heart, I felt myself to be a far better actor than Henry Irving, and if only for my admirable mimicry of heartbreak, more fully worthy of the accolade. Lucio did not attend the obsequies. He wrote me a brief note of sympathy from town, and hinted that he was sure I could understand his reasons for not being present. I did understand, of course, and appreciated his respect, as I thought, for me and my feelings. Yet strange and incongruous as it may seem, I never longed so much for his company as I did then. However, we had a glorious burial of my fair and false lady. Prancing horses drew coroneted carriages in a long defile down the pretty Warwickshire lanes to the grey old church, picturesque and peaceful, where the clergyman and his assistants, in newly washed surplices, met the flower-laden coffin and with the usual conventional mumblings, consigned it to the dust. There were even press reporters present, who not only described the scene as it did not happen, but who also sent fancy sketches to their respective journals of the church, as it did not exist. I mention this simply to show how thoroughly all proper forms were carried out and conceded to. After the ceremony, all we mourners went back to Willowsmere to luncheon, and I well remember that Lord Elton told me a new and risqué joke over a glass of port before the meal was finished. The undertakers had a sort of festive banquet in the servants' hall, 
and taking everything into due consideration, my wife's death gave a great deal of pleasure to many people, and put useful money into several ready pockets. She had left no blank in society that could not be easily filled up. She was merely one butterfly out of thousands, more daintily colored perhaps, and more restless in flight, but never judged as more than up to the butterfly standard. I said no one gave her an honest regret, but I was wrong. Mavis Clare was genuinely, almost passionately grieved. She sent no flowers for the coffin, but she came to the funeral by herself, and stood a little apart, waiting silently till the grave was covered in. And then, just as the fashionable train of mourners were leaving the churchyard, she advanced and placed a white cross of her own garden lilies upon the newly turned brown mould. I noticed her action, and determined that before I left Willowsmere for the east with Lucio, for my journey had only been postponed a week or two on account of Sybil's death, she should know all. The day came when I carried out this resolve. It was a rainy and chill afternoon, and I found Mavis in her study, sitting beside a bright log fire with her small terrier in her lap, and her faithful St. Bernard stretched at her feet. She was absorbed in a book, and over her watched the marble palace, inflexible and austere. As I entered, she rose, and putting down the volume and her pet dog together, she advanced to meet me with an intense sympathy in her clear eyes, and a wordless pity in the tremulous lines of her sweet mouth. It was charming to see how sorry she felt for me, and it was odd that I could not feel sorry for myself. After a few words of embarrassed greeting, I sat down and watched her silently, while she arranged the logs in the fire to make them burn brighter, and for the moment avoided my gaze. I suppose you know, I began with harsh abruptness, that the sleeping draft story is a polite fiction. You know that my wife poisoned herself intentionally. Mavis looked at me with a troubled and compassionate expression. I feared it was so, she began nervously. Oh, there is nothing either to fear or to hope, I said with some violence. She did it. And can you guess why she did it? Because she was mad with her own wickedness and sensuality. Because she loved with a guilty love my friend, Lucio Rimenez. Mavis gave a little cry as of pain, and sat down white and trembling. You can read quickly, I am sure, I went on. Part of the profession of literature is the ability to skim books and manuscripts rapidly, and grasp the whole gist of them in a few minutes. Read this, and I handed her the rolled-up pages of Sybil's dying declaration. Let me stay here while you learn from that what sort of a woman she was, and judge whether, despite her beauty, she is worth a regret. Pardon me, said Mavis gently. I would rather not read what was not meant for my eyes. "'But it is meant for your eyes,' I retorted impatiently. "'It is meant for everybody's eyes, apparently. "'It is addressed to nobody in particular. "'There is a mention of you in it. "'I beg, nay, I command you to read it. "'I want your opinion on it, your advice. "'You may possibly suggest, after perusal, "'the proper sort of epitaph I ought to inscribe on the monument "'I am going to build to her sacred and dear memory.' "'I covered my face with one hand.' to hide the bitter smile which I knew betrayed my thoughts, and pushed the manuscript towards her. Very reluctantly she took it, and slowly unrolling it, began to read. For several minutes there was a silence, broken only by the crackling of the logs on the fire, and the regular breathing of the dogs, who now both lay stretched comfortably in front of the wood blaze. I looked covertly at the woman whose fame I had envied, at the slight figure the coronal of soft hair, the delicate, drooping, sensitive face, the small, white, classic hand that held the written sheets of paper so firmly, yet so tenderly, the very hand of the Greek marble Psyche. And I thought what short-sighted asses some literary men are who suppose they can succeed in shutting out women like Mavis Clare from winning everything that fame or fortune can offer. Such a head as hers albeit covered with locks fair and caressable, was not meant, in its fine shape and compactness, for submission to inferior intelligences, whether masculine or feminine, 
that determined little chin which the firelight delicately outlined was a visible declaration of the strength of will and the indomitably high ambition of its owner and yet the soft eyes the tender mouth did not these suggest the sweetest love the purest passion that ever found a place in a woman's heart i lost myself in dreamy musing i thought of many things that had little to do with either my own past or present i realized that now and then at rare intervals god makes a woman of genius with a thinker's brain and an angel's soul and that such an one is bound to be a destiny to all mortals less divinely endowed and a glory to the world in which she dwells so considering i studied mavis clare's face and form i saw her eyes fill with tears as she read on why should she weep i wondered over that last document which had left me unmoved and callous i was startled almost as if from sleep when her voice thrilling with pain disturbed the stillness she sprang up gazing at me as if she saw some horrible vision oh you are blind she cried as to not see what this means can you not understand do you not know your worst enemy my worst enemy i echoed amazed you surprise me mavis what have i or my enemies or friends to do with my wife's last confession she raved between poison and passion she could not tell as you see by her final words whether she was dead or alive and her writing it all under such stress of circumstances was a phenomenal effort but it has nothing to do with me personally for god's sake do not be so hard-hearted said mavis passionately to me these last words of sibyl's poor tortured miserable girl are beyond all expression horrible and appalling do you mean to tell me you have no belief in a future life none i answered with conviction then this is nothing to you this solemn assurance of hers that she is not dead but living again living too in indescribable misery you do not believe it does any one believe the ravings of the dying i answered she was as i have said suffering the torments of poison and passion and in those torments wrote as one tormented is it impossible to convince you of the truth asked mavis solemnly are you so diseased in your spiritual perceptions as not to know beyond a doubt that this world is but a shadow of other worlds awaiting us i assure you as i live you will have that terrible knowledge forced upon you some day i am aware of your theories your wife had the same beliefs or rather non-beliefs as yourself yet she has been convinced at last i shall not attempt to argue with you if this last letter of the unhappy girl you wedded cannot open your eyes to the eternal facts you choose to ignore nothing will ever help you you are in the power of your enemy of whom are you speaking mavis i asked astonished observing that she stood like one suddenly appalled in a dream her eyes fixed musingly on vacancy and her lips trembling apart your enemy your enemy she repeated with energy it seems to me as if his shadow stood near you now listen to this voice from the dead sibyl's voice what does she say oh god have mercy i know who claims my worship now and drags me into yonder rolling world of flame his name is well i interrupted eagerly she breaks off there his name is lucio rimenez said mavis in a thrilling tone i do not know from whence he came but i take god to witness my belief that he is a worker of evil a fiend in beautiful human shape a destroyer and a corrupter the curse of him fell on sibyl the moment she met him the same curse rests on you leave him if you are wise take your chance of escape while it remains to you and never let him see your face again she spoke with a kind of breathless haste as though impelled by a force not her own i stared at her amazed and in a manner irritated such a course of action would be impossible to me mavis i said somewhat coldly the prince rimenez is my best friend no man ever had a better and his loyalty to me has been put to a severe test under which most men would have failed i have not told you all 
and I related in a few words the scene I had witnessed between my wife and Lucio in the music gallery at Willowsmere. She listened, but with an evident effort, and pushing back her clustering hair from her brows, she sighed heavily. "'I am sorry, but it does not alter my conviction,' she said. "'I look upon your best friend as your worst foe, and I feel you do not realize the awful calamity of your wife's death in its true aspect. Will you forgive me if I ask you to leave me now? Lady Sibyl's letter has affected me terribly. I feel I cannot speak about it any more. I wish I had not read it. She broke off with a little half-suppressed sob. I saw she was unnerved, and taking the manuscript from her hand, I said, half-banteringly, You cannot then suggest an epitaph for my wife's monument? She turned upon me with a grand gesture of reproach. "'Yes, I can,' she replied in a low, indignant voice. "'Inscribe it as, "'From a pitiless hand to a broken heart. "'That will suit the dead girl, and you, the living man.' Her rustling gown swept across my feet. She passed me and was gone. Stupefied by her sudden anger and equally sudden departure, I stood inert. The St. Bernard rose from the hearthrug and glowered at me suspiciously evidently wishing me to take my leave. Pallas Athena stared, as usual, through me and beyond me in a boundless scorn. All the various objects in this quiet study seemed silently to eject me as an undesired occupant. I looked round at once longingly, as a tired outcast may look on a peaceful garden and wish in vain to enter. How like her sex she is, after all, I said half aloud. She blames me for being pitiless and forgets that Sybil was the sinner, not I. No matter how guilty a woman may be, she generally manages to secure a certain amount of sympathy. A man is always left out in the cold. A shuddering sense of loneliness oppressed me as my eyes wandered round the restful room. The odor of lilies was in the air, exhaled, so I fancied, from the delicate and dainty personality of Mavis herself. If I had only known her first, and loved her, I murmured, as I turned away at last and left the house. But then I remembered I had hated her before I ever met her, and not only had I hated her, but I had vilified and misrepresented her work with a scurrilous pen under the shield of anonymity and out of sheer malice, thus giving her in the public sight the greatest proof of her own genius a gifted woman can ever win man's envy. End of chapter 37